everyone. All right. Design process eight, nine, eight. Or not. It's definitely eight or nine. The end is here, you guys. This is the last video in the design process series. Okay, I lied. There's going to be one more bonus video all about developing textile designs for within the context of a collection. But for all intents and purposes, this is the end. This is the video where I talk to you guys about final presentations, things to consider when putting your book together or putting a project together for a competition. And then I'm going to give you guys a few tips on just kind of your general uh, portfolio and the things that you need. So that's it. This is going to be pretty much the end of it. Do you guys feel like you're graduating a class or, you know, maybe just finishing a class? Final exam, bring me all your portfolios, make them all look amazing. Okay, don't, don't do that. Just quick review, we've done all the things, right? We have run around the world seeking inspiration and developed concepts and mood boards. We've developed color stories, we've developed fabric stories, we have played with shapes and proportions and we've developed our designs using our fabrics, creating 3D samples, and then we've edited, we've merchandised, we made more samples, we played with proportions and we played with different colorways and all these good things. You have a million things. And then at this stage, I do several things. Number one, I do my flats. These are not the beautiful, loose, quick sketches, but these are the meticulous, carefully thought out plans, just Every single line is going to be carefully placed on your piece of paper. You're going to place your darts perfectly, okay? You're going to lay out your quilting pattern. You're going to lay out your cutout pattern. You're going to position your pockets perfectly. You're going to center your buttons and position your buttonholes. You're going to draw in your lapels and figure out the proportions for, you know, this lapel is going to be twice as deep as your armhole. And this double lapel feature, the bottom piece is going to be one third of the entire width right? One third, one third, one third, right? And then the back, you know, you have, when you do your back flats, you have to think, how does the design wrap around? These points need to connect or you have to design how they're going to connect. You don't always have to do side flats, but you also have to think about what the side is going to look like or what the three quarter is going to look like in your design. I don't know if you remember this from like 800 videos ago, but remember, no coffin garments, guys. What are coffin garments? Coffin garments are those garments where you only design here. Basically, all you would see when you're laying in a coffin. I know it's kind of morbid and you're like, wow, Zoe, you took that to a dark place. But I mean, it's a visual that will stay with you, right? I'm all about teaching in ways that will get you to remember, <laughs> right? So no coffin garments. You have to think of the entire body. People look at your backs. People look at your sides, you know, all that good stuff. And so, you know, when you develop your sides and your backs, you have to think about, you know, when you have a design like this, are you going to have the braid just in the front or are you going to have the braid wrap around to the back? If the braid does wrap around to the back, is it going to go all the way down like it does in the front? Are you going to just cut it off here because you don't want the body to look too thick with the braid that comes all the way around? Or do you not want it to look cheap and chintzy by cutting it off like right at the shoulder seam? What do you want to do? You're the designer, but you have to think these things out, okay? Be deliberate. You are going to have a very precise, skinny mechanical pencil. You are going to have a nice clear graph ruler. You're going to use tracing paper. You're going to fold things over to get your symmetry correct. Even if the interior, you know, you can have designs like this where the interior is asymmetrical, but the base silhouette will be symmetrical. You could do these by hand. I have an entire video series devoted to how to create flaps. You can do them in Illustrator. I'm going to have a couple of videos on how to work in Adobe Illustrator uh, coming up this fall. 
but you need to get really precise with your flats. Number two, this is where I design my final packaging and formatting. I do rough diagrams on how I'm going to lay everything out. I pull final images for my mood board. I make sure I have enough fabric to make all the swatches and 3D samples that I need. I go buy some more if I don't. Like if you are just putting a project together for your portfolio for your book, okay, just neatly professionally formatted pages in a book like this is fine. You might want to get a little bit more creative in your packaging if you're doing a competition. Just make sure that your packaging fits the mood and concept of your original project. And two, it fits the uh, competition rules. Okay, If they have certain rules for how things need to be sent in, what size things need to be, make sure you follow those. You don't want to lose just because of a technicality. When you're designing these packages, Make sure it's something that can be opened and closed easily by the judges. Because when you enter these competitions, you are generally sending these things off to someone and they're going to be looking through it without you. And so don't develop anything that's too tricky that you have to explain to someone how to open. Okay? They just want to open it and close it. You know, I've seen some cool things. I, you know, I've seen great competition projects just in a net, in a regular portfolio book. I've seen ones where it's in a book, but then they redesign the cover. You know, I've seen books where the pages are made out of fabric, like everything is drawn out on paper and then they've been mounted onto fabric. I've seen somewhere it's just an ordinary book, but it was put in a really cool looking box. So, you know, you can keep things pretty simple, but, you know, develop something cool, like a, a cool cover that reflects your concept, you know, things like that. And then I go buy everything, okay? After I've mapped out how I'm going to get everything laid out, I go and buy the book. I have to buy the book. I have to make sure that my final papers fit in my book and that I'm sketching out my final illustrations to fit the book. Okay, everything has to fit, right? You don't want to have a an do a bunch of illustrations and then realize, oh no, my book is too small. I have to go buy a new book. Like, I know that sounds really simple, but I give you these tips from either my own experience or me watching either my classmates or my students make these mistakes. Okay, so make sure you gather all your materials, make sure they all fit, they're all the right size or that you can cut them down to the right size for everything to fit so that later on when you're laying out your croquis and putting your pages together, you have the final size. Everything is fitting to your final size. When I draw flats, I draw them big. I, these are fairly big. It's just so that I can make sure I can get in there with every detail. And then later, if I want to format things, I will scan all these things in, shrink them down, and then redraw them all. In Photoshop, I did the formatting for the flats where I laid them all out as little pieces and, you know, and uh, overlap them and made sure that they would fit. Like I had my book size, I knew what size my final paper was going to be. And so... I knew how many flats I wanted to fit on each sheet of paper and then I formatted it and then I printed everything and you're like, Zoe, I don't have a printer that big. That's fine. What I did was I printed this and then I printed this and then I taped it together. Okay. And then I redrew everything beautifully, you know, added my marker touches for shadows and all that beautiful business. Next, number four. Are we on number four? Number four. I style my models. This is me playing around with different croquis. Well, I was playing around with this. Like, do I like this pose? Do I, do I want even a face? Maybe I don't want a face. Do I want a face? Maybe I want hair. Try different skin tones, different hair colors, different hairstyles. Remember, my original concept was something that was all ages, all genders. And so I was trying to keep things a little bit more, nothing too overtly feminine in the makeup. So yeah, so I was playing around with those ideas. I also think about accessories. Accessories is a big thing. When I was in school, it was so long ago. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so old. It was so long ago that 
uh, we didn't really think too much about accessories unless you were an accessories designer. Okay. We, we of course had to have shoes on our models. Okay. But the focus was the clothes. And so we designed the clothes and, you know, a lot of us were in the mindset that you should make the clothes good enough that you don't need anything. You don't need special formatting. You don't need accessories or, you know, cool styling to make them stand out. I'm not trying to diminish the role of stylists. I'm saying as designers, our job is to make the clothes good enough without special styling. But at the very least, you have to do shoes. These days, accessories are such a huge part of the fashion machine. I, they've always been a big deal, but even more so now where it's really the money that comes from accessories that pushes the fashion machine. And, you know, you ne there are so many brands where you would never see them try to put together a runway show without having a full lineup of special label shoes and bags, sunglasses, all that. Right. And so you do have to consider your accessories. At this stage, I also think about different illustration styles. Like, do I want something a little bit looser? Do I want something that's super tight and specific? If you follow me on Pinterest, you may already know this, but I have, I have several boards. They're all for my students' reference. Number one, I have one called Fashion Illustration. And number two, I have one called Design Communication. Now, the design communication board is all full of fashion illustration where I believe that they're cool in the style and the rendering is really cool, but also it shows enough information where you are communicating the design. The other board, fashion illustration, is a board full of images where the illustrations are cool they're not really clear enough where I can tell what the garment is going to be like. But, you know, the styles are cool. And so I encourage you to look at both of them. Like, look at the design communication. Look at the ones where, okay, there has to be a certain amount of information for someone to read your design, especially in a context like this. And then the fashion illustration is just inspiration. Like there's just some cool things. And there are some images or a lot of images in the fashion illustration board where you can take that really cool loose style and just kind of push it just a little bit further and give it a little bit more information to make it into more design communication. So go look at things, go look at my boards, go look at your own things, what have you, and see if there's a style that really fits your original concept. And then I start pulling croquis. I go through my croquis. I pull the ones that I think are going to work for this project in terms of the attitude of the pose. You know, of course, I repeat some of them. I, you know, if I'm doing 10 figures, I don't have a different pose for each one, but I like to have a combination of frontal, three-quarter, side, at least. I play around with them. Remember in my how to use croquis figures, I had talked about how when I finish a croquis, I like to scan it in the computer. I have a whole file folder that's nothing but croquis. And so when I'm working on a project like this, I will go into Photoshop, I will pull the croquis, I will look at the images that I have, and I'll start putting together a composition in Photoshop with the croquis that I think will work with a certain project. You can also do this with paper and scissors and tape without a computer. That's fine. And then, you know, you have your flats, you have your design, so you can start building your outfits. They don't have to be the exact outfit put together the same way you did in your, your quick sketches. If you think of something cooler, go for it. I also think about which design is going to work best on which figure. For example, pants, I'm going to want to use a figure where the legs are standing apart, especially if my pants are a wide leg. If I know I designed a cool armhole or something, I'm going to show off some of the three-quarter side view, I know I'm going to put it on this kind of figure to really emphasize that design point. And then I start drawing them out. 
just quick sketches. I have the figures. I throw things on. So again, here, you know, they're not perfect, but I threw down the dresses and the shirts and the pants and whatnot. And then in this one, this layer, I threw down the coats. Okay. I do it like this. So if I want to repair coats or move jackets around, I don't have to erase all of this stuff. And then once I have finalized my outfits and what figures they're going on and my figure composition and my clothing composition, I draw things out as well as I can because this is what I'm going to use when I do my final illustration. I'm going to do all my mistakes on my tracing paper, erasing, cleaning, everything. And then I'm going to tape this to my final watercolor paper and I'm going to trace it out on a light box. And I do this because I do not like erasing on my final paper. It messes up the texture. Sometimes not all the lead will come off. It makes me crazy. Okay, so I make all my mistakes here. And then my final is as clean as possible. At this stage, I will scan these in or make Xerox copies and play with color layout. When you're working in the industry, almost every garment is going to be produced in multiple colorways, except for something that is really special, like a couple of really editorial pieces that are covered in embellishments and you only have them to send out to magazines. Other than those super special precious garments or that, you know, really expensive leather that doesn't come in more than one colorway, you're going to have your blouses and your sweaters come in multiple colorways. And so this is where I pick a colorway and I go with it and I lay down the color because I want to make sure that there's color flow. I don't want, see, I have all these ombre knit pieces. I have the lavender smoky gray shearling. I have the white leather. I have the metallic brocade and I don't want to cluster any of them. I don't want all my metallics accidentally lumped over here and I have no metallics over here. I don't want all my pink things in one section. And so I just take some markers really quick and I run it through. Okay. And so I have my ombre knit pieces dispersed. I have my chartreuse sprinkled through here. And then here, here, and here, I have my metallics here, here, and here, right? All the way through. I don't have like a big block of black. There are basically two goals in composition. Okay? You either create a composition where you want the person to focus on one thing only. And you develop a composition that makes that one thing stand out. Or you develop a composition where you want the eye to move all the way across. For us, especially for these multi-figure uh, collection drawings, you want the person to look at all your clothes. People are naturally going to gravitate towards the things that they like. But you want to get their eye moving. And one of the ways to do that is to push the colors and textures throughout your composition. So you have all your rough drafts, you have your styling figured out, you have your accessories figured out, you have the style, you're going to illustrate everything figured out, you bought all your paper and your fabrics, and now you're going to put everything together. You're going to make your 3D samples and your final fabrics all over again, work on your sewing, make them beautiful, trim them beautifully, and format them well on your pages, okay? You don't want to like have things fall. Look at this. This is crooked. This is so annoying right now. And I should have trimmed more of these threads. You don't want to sit there in your job interview later and stick your hand in here and be like, oops, this fell. Hold on a minute. Trim your swatches beautifully. If you have any of these garments made, you know, take a minute and do a mini photo shoot, okay? I don't mean a huge elaborate spectacle with hairspray flying all over the place. I mean, get a model, a fit model, or a dress form that fits your garments, okay? Nothing is gonna ruin the effect like a poor fit. Make sure that you have nice, clean, bright lighting, and you can see all the details. 
you know, pose your model or mannequin neatly so that the garment really shines. Print them out on nice paper, make sure the colors are right, you know, trim them beautifully and format them on your pages. Make sure you get a front, back, and side. Uh, any close-ups, if you have special details, if you have a cool interior, like maybe you have, you know, a contrast lining with, you know, cool pockets on the inside. All right, and then you're going to put your book together. Number one, title page. Keep it simple. Don't overthink this page. They're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. Something that has your name on it, has the name of your project, something that reflects your original concepts. Here is your mood board with your final images, etc., etc. You can have your color story here, okay, if you want to have color chips or if you have images that reflect your color story. And I have this red, brown, chartreuse color story, and then I have the purple and chartreuse color story. I separated out the color stories and I organized my fabrics. I have my 3D samples all done, you know, large. You don't want a quilting swatch this big. How is anyone going to figure out how it's going to look? You want them big enough where you can get a real sense of how it's going to look on the body. If you are a student and you have limited resources, you know, at the very least, draw them out. This is a fur and braid twist. This is a, this I didn't actually include in my final designs, but it was a quilting pattern that mimicked uh, stained glass windows. And then I had developed a print using this look and thought that I would include that. And then, you know, I had this brocade. It was a 3D brocade that was gonna be done in metallic stitches and then metal studs. You know, I had all these ideas and I included them to show you guys that if you, you know, if you don't, if you can't get to an embroiderer and be like, hey, can you embroider me this stuff? You should at the very least illustrate the images life size as closely to what you really want as possible. When you are showing your portfolio, you want to use as few words as possible to explain your project because you want your visuals to be good enough that any explanation would be, might be nice, but completely unnecessary. And when you're sending these projects out for competitions, you are not going to be around to explain things. And I see students writing these big mission statements and essays and put them on their title page. I'm not a big fan of a lot of text in these kinds of projects because usually they go unread. Mostly those judges, they're looking at a million things and they want to get a feel for it by looking at all the pretty pictures and then move on. They don't want to read a novel. If they wanted to read a novel, they would work for a publishing house. And then you're going to have your double truck of your final illustrations. You're going to have several illustrations. You're going to have the full layout of the entire collection so that it can be viewed as a whole. See how well things are merchandised, see how everything looks together. People can see your rendering skills, your designing skills, your design communication skills, how everything comes together. And then you're gonna take each of these illustrations and you're gonna have them on its own sheet of paper and next to the illustration, you're going to have the flats for this entire outfit, the vest, the sweater, the pants, front, back, and if necessary, side or close-up detail flats, and then swatches for that outfit somewhere formatted on that page. And you're going to do that for every single outfit. You're going to have multiple projects in your portfolio and you're going to want a, a couple of them to be this elaborate. On a couple of them, you can just do the double truck and then you could do a double truck of flats. But you definitely want a couple of them to be super elaborate so that you can really showcase your skills. And then after that, you can have photos of complete garments. If you have them, those are not necessary. And then I personally, okay, really enjoy process sketches. For competition, 
you're not going to include process sketches unless it is part of the competition package. But when I'm reviewing portfolios to hire someone, I actually enjoy looking at process, process sketches. And again, this is not something that you need. This is optional. And maybe you only do this for a couple of projects. Okay, like I mentioned before, you can have a couple where everything is super elaborate. You have all the things. And then you can have a couple of projects where it's really like, here are my concepts. And you already know I could do all this stuff, but I want to show you that I can you know, explore these concepts as well. Okay, so you can have less elaborate projects. Just make sure you have a combination. You don't want a bunch of half-assed, half-finished projects in your portfolio. So I like process pictures. You know, I like really getting into the mind of a designer, seeing you know, how they design and then how they ended up with their finals. Like, oh, what did you end up editing out? And this is for a designer. Tech designers should focus on tech packs and photos of finished garments. Pattern makers should focus on pattern cards. Their act they should bring their actual patterns and garments to the interview. You know, this kind of portfolio is for designers. So when you're putting your portfolio book together, how many projects do you need? My recommendation is to make six projects and show four at each interview. And you're thinking, holy, that is a lot of work, Zoe. I know. You want the job or not? Think about all the different kinds of design jobs that you're interested in. You know, especially in the beginning, like later on as you develop your style and you hone in on what your aesthetic is, you know, your book can get more specific. But if you're get, just getting started, think about all the kinds of design jobs that you would be interested in and create a project that reflects that, okay? So when I graduated, I wanted to focus on women's wear. I didn't want to do swimwear or active. I liked all kinds of women's wear. I liked casual. I liked dressy. I even liked designing stuff for work. So I did a really weird avant-garde evening wear project that was inspired by long haul truckers. Don't ask. It seemed like a good idea at the time, okay? I had a project that was all about denim. I love working with denim. I had an evening wear collection that was way more conventional than the one on the truckers. <laughs> It was pretty and it was colorful and you could actually wear it somewhere other than a runway. I had a day wear collection, women's wear, that was inspired by two movies mashed together. I had a project that was mostly hoodies and tees and sweatshirts that because I love playing with fashion graphics and I wanted to showcase my Adobe Illustrator skills. And then I had a project that was heavy on suiting. I mean, it was a little power suitish, I guess, but definitely like work appropriate, really more like powerful woman, you know, striding across a marble floor and wide leg trousers and high heeled loafers, like that kind of thing. Like I love women's wear, all different kinds. I had those projects. And then for each job interview, I would shuffle the most related projects to the front of my book. You know, you do some research on the company that you're interviewing with, find out what they're into. They might not be into any kind of evening wear. And so I would move all the evening wear to the back. Or maybe they were all into quirky, experimental, different. And so I didn't want to do put the heavy suiting in the front. Right? So think about the skills you want to showcase and the design aesthetic you want to showcase the most. And then shuffle those to the four. Most companies, they'll have made up their mind whether they want to call you in for a second interview or not by like your second project. But you have the four so you can, they can look at them. You know, if they really want to, they can look at the back, but you can just, you know, have a few blank pages separating that and just, you know. You know how everyone says keep your resume one page long? because of attention spans and you need to show that you know how to edit down to what's important. Just like that, your portfolio, there should be a limit to how much you show people. By the way, you guys, all of your resume should only be one page long. Just FYI, guys, don't ask me much more on careers and interviews. And, you know, I'm not a big expert on that. I've actually not gone on a lot of job interviews in my life. Um, 
that could sound like bragging that could sound like self-deprecating but in all honesty that's just the facts okay i've not gone on a lot of job interviews so i'm not a career counselor and most of you know by now that if i don't feel like i have a lot of information on a subject i just won't talk about it but i do know how to put together a pretty book <laughs> And that's it, you guys. That is the design process series. Like I mentioned before, I'm going to have that textile design uh, video in a few weeks. But yeah, this is the design process for one project. And you should do this over and over again until you get better and better and better and better. There are reasons why the school I graduated from the school I teach at, other schools where I learned their program, they all have multiple design classes. You go through these programs, you don't just have one design class and then you're like, okay, you are off to go design things. No, it's a process that you have to keep repeating and practicing over and over again for good reason. This stuff is hard. Remember, it's hard because it's hard, not because there's anything wrong with you. So yeah, you're going to have to keep doing this over and over again until you come up with some cool design projects that work. All right, I'm done babbling. You guys know the drill. Any questions, check the info box, check the other comments. You know, maybe you'll get your answer faster that way. You still can't find it. Drop me a comment. I've been getting a lot of comments lately saying like, oh, I think this is a stupid question or this, is, this might sound silly. But you know what? To me on this channel, as long as you're not rude, it's fine. Ask me if it's related to what I'm teaching and not rude. It's fine. So ask me the questions and, uh, yeah, you know, share, subscribe, like, which I always appreciate. And, uh, I will see you next time.